everybody, today I'm going to do Juliet's very popular monologue, Gallop Pays You Fiery Footed Steeds. So the first thing you need to know before you watch any further is that there will be sexual references in this video and in this monologue. So if you are not comfortable with that, then you need to turn off the video and also don't do this monologue for your audition or exam because it is about her being excited about having sex with Romeo. That is what it's about. So if you have any lofty ideas of her being like, tra la la Romeo, that's not what's going on. Um, and I'm gonna explain a little bit about the meanings about what she's saying, some of which are quite complicated because she gets into a lot of wordplay. She's clearly very excited and she's kind of riffing and punning and doing all that kind of language business that they do. Um, and in Shakespeare's day, the whole sexual reference thing was a lot less of a big deal than it is now. So, um, let's dig into some of that. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an insight into what it means. I don't want to go too far into it, so I highly recommend that you get a good version of um, whatever you're studying. Don't just get an online version, get like a proper version from the library that's got like some footnotes, okay? That's important. Um, because there are quite a lot of references in it. There are there are some things in here that you you might want to get a clearer idea. The reason I'm not going to go too far into the meanings this time is because I think you need to understand and take and have some thought about her emotional connection to it and getting a sense of the beats and how to play it in performance. I think that's more useful for me to talk about that with you. And you do the homework and go and double check um, all the meanings. It's not that complicated. Okay, it's a little bit complicated. Okay, so <laughs> let's start with, I'm going to give, so if anyone's watching this that's a Shakespeare purist, hopefully you're not, I am giving fairly rough overviews of this. Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds, towards Phoebus' lodging. Such a wagoner as Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Oh, she's so excited. And she's really excited to attack this. What she's going on is she is looking out at the sun and going, come on, sun, get down. It is, I want nighttime. And the fiery-footed steeds, basically what she means is like flaming horses, this mythological reference towards Phoebus lodging. This is the sun god traveling home with his um, sun wagon driven by horses. Um, such a wagoner as Phaeton. I believe Phaeton was um, Phoebus' son who drove the horses and um, uh, would whip you to the west being like Phaeton's like a young fiery sun god, like he gets it. He knows that night time's what we want. And bring in cloudy night immediately. So a lot of energy in that first bit, that's really great for any audition to start with a bit of a bang and having a clear eye line to um, wherever the sun is. So having a clear, whatever, wherever, wherever you are, whatever space you're in, give some thought to where Juliet is. So you're probably only going to have a chair or an empty space or something to play with in your audition exam. So um, think about, am I sitting on a bed? Um, she's in her bedroom. So think like, how big is my bed? Or am I standing at the window? You don't need a lot of movement in this, but you really want to have a clear mental picture if you do do any movement, um, where things are that you're looking at and where you're moving to and from, um, as you always should, but certainly in this monologue. So that's your first bit, a lot of energy, woo woo. Next bit, spread thy close curtain, love performing night, that runaway eyes may wink, and Romeo leap to these arms, untalked of and unseen. So you can hear I've kind of gone to a slightly different energy there. I think she gets, she starts getting a little bit more romantic-y there, the close curtain, she's like, oh, you know, let's bring in the night. Oh, it's so romantic and bloody blah, blah. Runaway eyes may wink. Um, there are different, explanations of what that means but I think of it as being like if anybody is sort of out and about in the night wink in Shakespeare means blink meaning that they won't they'll close their eyes and not see Romeo sneak because sneak to her um because it's dark basically that's what that whole bit means um something that you might want to layer in your performance is that she's going to be slightly worried is it it is a little bit um, scary and dangerous for him to come to her but 
she's super super excited still but there's there might be a little bit more conflict in that or a, a bit of worry or um that's that can be an objective that you play with next lovers can see to do their amorous rites by their own beauties or if love be blind it best agrees with night um this is her kind of riffing here i think she starts to kind of go well I think she's kind of enjoying herself talking about this stuff. And here's probably a good point, um, good time to talk about. Um, this is a soliloquy, so she is alone on stage. With soliloquies, you can talk to the audience. That is something that people did, um, actors did in Shakespeare's day. However, in this monologue, it does actually make a lot of sense that she might just be talking to herself and reflecting, or maybe she's talking to the sun, maybe she's talking to her teddy, whatever works for you. I generally um, advocate for whatever works for you is good. So if it helps you to imagine that you're talking to the audience, great. If it helps you to talk to a teddy, great. If it helps you to talk to a mirror, great. Whatever it is, play with those different things and see um, what works best. Um, but particularly whenever you're talking to yourself, make sure you are clear about your eye line. It is very common as humans that whenever we are thinking or maybe we're reflecting to ourselves, we look down as I just did then. But in performance, you can't do that. So you need to practice looking up. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Practice looking up when you're thinking, whenever you're talking to yourself and pick points when you get into the exam room or audition room, pick points in the room that are gonna be your, ah, I'm thinking to myself here. Rehearse your eyeline as part of your rehearsal of your monologue altogether. So she's um, talking about here, let me explain what it means. Lovers can see to do their amorous rites by their own beauties. Now, own beauties could be different things, but basically what she's saying is like, we don't need sunshine because um, lovers can, amorous rites means like whatever hokey pokey you're getting up to. Um, <laughs> Hokey pokey, whatever you want to call it. Um, they don't need light for it because their own beauty is going to be shining through. Or uh, beauties could have a lot of different meanings, so you can decide what you want it to mean. But basically, it means like because <laughs> um, lovers are beautiful and um, excited and full of desire, they're going to light up the room by themselves and they don't need the sun. Next bit, or if love be blind, it best agrees with night. That's just kind of the old saying that love is blind, um, which I'm pretty sure Shakespeare came up with anyway. Thanks, Shakespeare, for referencing yourself. Um, it best agrees with night being like, well, if it's blind, then nighttime works, right? So she's just kind of reasoning like, yeah, because she's a smart lady. She's kind of, when she is speaking, when she's talking out loud to herself, she's clever. So she is actually kind of rationalizing and um and playing she's playing with a lot of this stuff especially this next bit so maybe there's a little bit of a joke to there a joke in that of like oh if love be blind that's up to you but she she is playful and she is clever next come civil night thou soup so ugh, sorry blah you should do a vocal warm-up before i do these videos and you should do a vocal warm-up too you need to come civil night <laughs> thou sober suited matron all in black and learn me how to lose a winning match played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods so this is an interesting one so she's just kind of been talking about um <clears throat> she's been talking about love being you know a curtain and she's been talking about the sun and it's been quite like poetic and uh, expansive and glamorous and all that kind of thing and now she's switching and she's talking about civil night and uh, a sober suited matron being like a kind of governess in a black dress coming in and being like hey I'm nighttime go to bed um, but and coming in and saying this is how you do it and what she's talking about here it's an it's really interesting imagery that she comes up with it's, it can be very clever, but also sometimes I'm like, I don't know if you're really making sense here, Juliet, <laughs> which is fine if she's not, because she is very young and very excited about what's happening. So this governess, in this kind of um, analogy that she's giving, this go governess is coming in, nighttime governess coming in, being bossy, and saying, teaching her how to lose a winning match. In this case, she's talking about lose a winning match is a play on words she's talking about losing her virginity to her match which is romeo 
played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods. So played, playing for something being like the prize is a pair of stainless maidenhoods being um, the pair is her and Romeo and stainless maidenhoods means like pure virginity. So she's sort of saying, um, teach me how to, um, she's playing on references to like playing games or playing cards or whatever, something that you can win. Um, but she, with the layering, the, the entendre of, of um, that she's losing her virginity, but she's going to win because she's winning Romeo and she's winning this amazing experience and love and all those kinds of things. So it's, it's complex, the stuff that she's talking about. And because of that, what you need to think about then is what kind of mood is she in here? Like when she's talking about that stuff, don't get caught up. It's very common for people to do Shakespeare and be very like, do we do be do? I am doing Shakespeare and oh, I am Juliet and come this and blah blah blah. But actually, like, this stuff is visceral, she is feeling it, she is in the mood. And, um, just a side note anytime the word come was used, that was supposed to be double entendre, like, we would kind of maybe sometimes use it like that today. Back in those days, they already get in the picture of what she's talking about. And when she's saying things like, come this, come that, it's supposed to be really clear that she is in the mood, okay? So don't shy away from that. You want to play with the hitting the consonants. Come, you know, go, go for it. You have to be really brave and connect to that. Um, and as I said before, if that's something that you're not super comfortable with, you need to find a way to at least connect to the person inside you that remembers how to be young and in love. If you are young and in love, then lucky you. But if you're old like me, if you can remember what it was like to be young and in love and the excitement of it, even if it's not a sexual excitement, that excitement you need to connect to. And that should be pretty much do the job and the language the language will do the rest as long as you don't shy away from it so she starts getting I think a little bit oh okay well um civil mate uh, civil knight and sober suit and matron you tell me what to do and I am gonna win this thing it's very interesting so play with it what kind of game is she playing here with herself? What is she imagining? She's in her mind playing out all these different versions. So when you're saying that stuff, make sure that you've connected some imagery to it. Maybe when she's talking about the matron, maybe she's thinking about her nurse coming in and being like, um, Julia, let me tell you all about how to do this thing. Not her nurse is a bit too daggy to be imagined, but maybe it's somebody else that she knew, like a governess that she's you know, a friend's governess or something like that, or a lady in waiting or something like that. Have some imagery in your head about what does that f feel like to you, or maybe she's imagining that she's playing a game with Romeo, that kind of thing, okay? So even though it's wordplay and she's not literally playing a, a game of cards or something, there's a reason she's bringing out this imagery, because it's a game. Okay, so let's go, <laughs> let's go to the next bit. So hopefully so far what you've got is there are kind of different beats she that she gets into bit by bit they have a little bit of a different energy to them so you need to be really clear about how you're going to play each next bit it's not all the same wishy-washy love 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 okay you need to be clear next hood my unmanned blood baiting in my cheeks with thy black mantle till strange love grown bold think true love acted simple modesty Ooh, so this one I find quite complex in the language, but what you need to understand, because what she's actually referring to here is falconry, which, you know, modern audience, not going to get, right? Like, hood my unmanned blood baiting in my cheeks. She's talking about they used to put hoods on falcons when they were training and they, like, calm them down when, like, young falcons were, like, going to run off, fly off, run off. That... Um, with thy blank mantle, it's talking about night. So that's how she's tying back into night. Basically, what she's saying here is night, come and um, hide me, calm me down, keep me sort of a little bit contained. 
um, and maybe modest until I find the courage and the natural consequence of things of, of someone that I um, true love, that, like my true love and my, uh, my husband, until that all sort of comes to fruition and it all makes sense and it all feels okay. So simple modesty. So think true love acted simple modesty and being kind of like, Oh, this I find this language it's it's very it can be quite complex in its way that it so basically she's saying that it it doesn't feel like a big deal anymore that it actually feels like completely natural and that's probably where you need to know that even though back in those days it wasn't such a big deal to talk about sex on stage for example it's still it's still a big deal for her as a character so she's kind of like okay knight she's been asking knight for different things right she's been knight she's been saying like knight um hide romeo knight um come and teach me how to do this thing and now she's saying knight keep me hidden because i might embarrass myself <laughs> and i feel kind of embarrassed about this and this is crazy and i don't know how to do this Next, and this is where it starts to really heat up because she's repeating the word come a lot, so take the hint. Come night, come Romeo, come thou day and night, for thou wilt lie upon the wings of night, whiter than new snow upon a raven's back. So she's very lyrical here, and I think that's partly because it's not just a Shakespeare thing, it's because she is a romantic at heart and she wants to be lyrical here so don't always assume when there's poetry in shakespeare that's because shakespeare just likes to do poetry it's always appropriate for the character so she is really imagining here like romeo come thou day in my in night means like um the you know a spark of light that's going to come um that's going to arrive when we're together and it's going to be like a blazing day for thou wilt lie upon the wings of night, whiter than new snow upon the, a raven's back. So basically like um, this time is going to arrive and be as, as bright as day or as bright as um, s snow on a raven's back. It's going to stand out and it's going to shine and basically this whole thing is going to blow your mind. Um, like blow her mind really. Next. So that is very, that bit is very evocative. Um, and it's very like, uh, it's kind of explosive in a sort of quiet way. Next, come gentle night. So she's kind of been like, ah, oh, this thing's amazing. And then come gentle night. She's changing a little bit. Come loving black browed night. Give me my Romeo. So I think there what's interesting is she's starting to plead. I think she's really, she's gone from this like, ah. Oh, snow on the on the raven's back to night give me this give it to me give it to me and she's starting to beg i think this is the desire coming through and it's and she's really ripe <laughs> oh that's a horrible word but this is where it starts to get she's very it's very clear because coming next and when i shall die Take him and cut him out in little stars and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. What you need to understand is the reference to die is an orgasm. It's not about her literally dying, although you could also take it as the double entendre of like we know as the audience is now that she is actually going to die later. And so that's a different sort of... Um, irony that that dramatic irony that we understand now as audiences um but back in shakespeare's day especially if they'd never seen the play before the die thing was like she means when she orgasms so she's starting to become very very clear there give me my romeo and when i shall die take him and cut him out in little stars and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun this is a very interesting bit because you can take it fairly at face value in that she's saying like, once I've had my orgasm, take Romeo and it's, it's a weird one. 
because it makes more sense if you think of it as her being like, when I literally die, I hope Romeo will die too and kind of become part of the stars. That makes more sense than what she's actually saying um, in Shakespeare's day, which was like, when I orgasm, take him can also mean um, give him an orgasm too. So uh, this is where I sort of go, okay, you get the idea, right? You get that she's being very, uh, there's a lot of desire here. There's a lot of lust. She's pretty out there and she knows what she wants. And this is a moment on stage where she is being really honest, um, I think with herself. And this is why I couldn't, probably wouldn't play this bit to an audience, like to like imagining that you're directly talking to an audience is probably not c correct. It's not gonna work as well because this is a private moment where she's really connecting to like, I want this and that can be full on. And so, even though we know from study that the die bit meant an orgasm and maybe take him and cut him out in little stars, she's kind of talking about like him having an orgasm as well. It's actually maybe more useful to you as an actor to just be like, you know what? I'm going to literally imagine that what she means is I love him so much that when I die, I want him to be part of heaven and everyone's going to love him as much as I do. I actually think that that can be more helpful than being literal. So I hope you take that from this video in general is that you can dig into the meanings of Shakespeare as much as you want. And especially when it comes to sexual references, there is actually a lot of information out there about what it meant back then. But ultimately you have to make the choices that work for you as a performer. And if it's getting too complex and some of this is complex wordplay, just, take the feeling of it and the feeling that's going on here is that she is taking off and she is just full of love and desire and she just can't imagine it she doesn't know what's going to happen she can't even deal with it so let's get to the next bit um that's pretty much the kind of climax and um pun intended of this monologue the next bit Oh, I have bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it. And though I am sold, not yet enjoyed. <clears throat> Anytime you have an O, oh, <clears throat> that should be like, oh, that shouldn't be like, oh, I have. It's always like a guttural sound. So like, oh, I have bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it. So mansion kind of being like the, the um, body, like the housing of a love, but not possessed it. So she's talking about buying something, but she's not really in it yet so she's using a kind of real estate um uh, analogy here but if you imagine mansion what she's saying is like i've i've bought this thing being that she married him so i've bought this amazing thing but i haven't got to actually go in there yet so she again she's been pretty clear there um possessed of being sexually possessed and though i am sold not yet enjoyed so she's bought something and she's also sold so she's kind of saying it's two ways so um, Romeo has also bought her, um, she's been sold, but he hasn't enjoyed her yet either. So again, this is stuff, you cannot argue that this is uh, not sexual, <laughs> it's not possible to argue that. So tedious is this day as, the, as is the night before some festival to an impatient child that hath new robes and may not wear them. Um, so very, very clear little analogy there and it's interesting because that's when she sort of changes back into like the little kid which is an interesting play there and you might decide to kind of go really go with that which I think brings us back to like oh my goodness she is really young and that's a really interesting choice to take you might just go with something more fun and light though that's up to you so but what she's saying is like there's going to be a big party and it's like this is and so this is as annoying as like if I were a kid and I'd like had a new dress and it was a big party and I couldn't even wear my dress. That, that just shows how young she is because she's like, oh, my dress and I'm like a child. Yes, you are. Um, and then the next bit, which is sometimes included is, oh, here comes my nurse and she brings news and every tongue that speaks, but Romeo's name speaks heavenly eloquence, which is again, that kind of dramatic irony because we know that she's about to come and say, uh, Romeo has killed your cousin. <laughs> so it, things are going to get ruined real quick. Now nurse, what news, what hast thou there? Blah, blah, blah. That's not usually included. So I'll stop that there. Um, 
out of all that, I hope you've got the shape of the monologue in your mind that it sort of, it starts with a bang. It's, she's taking different tacks of like, night, please do this, night, please do that, a night this, a night that. And then it kind of builds up to this like, oh, it's gonna be like a raven, rah, rah, rah. and then give me this thing. And then, oh my goodness, this is so annoying. And oh, that kind of, that's how I imagine the shape. You might have a different approach, but you do whatever you do. Do understand the different sections and that they should feel different. She's having a lot of different feelings. Play with putting that energy in different parts of your body, especially so you're not affecting your voice by kind of getting too carried away like this and it um, impacting your performance. You do need to, you need to be in control of it. Um, don't overblock this monologue. So don't kind of go and now I'm going to run to the window and now I'm going to go over here. It's interesting because she has got so much going on inside herself. She needs a rich inner life. That means you need to be connected to your emotion. You need to place it in your body and you need to have clear imagery in your head about what you're talking about. You need to have clear eye line about where you're going to speak when you speak each bit. You could actually speak this, this whole monologue could be in one spot directed to one eye line point of focus. It, it's so much about what's going on inside her. So be clear, um, do your homework so you understand and make your decisions about um, her different kind of character shifts in there and also what kind of level of the language you're gonna play. You don't need to overplay it. Now you know all these sexual references that I've explained to you, that can just be underneath that you don't need to play that, that's just there, as long as you enjoy that language. And that's where I'll finish. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments, like, subscribe, all that jazz, because I love, love, love that people actually are watching some of these videos, and please let me know if you want me to do any particular monologues. This is a fabulous monologue, and I really wish you luck with um, whatever you're doing it for. Thanks, everybody, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.